Bob Dylan's The Times, They Are a Changin'. It was written in 1964. It was actually never released as a single in the United States. Um, it's just one of the songs on the album, even though the album was of the same name. It was released in Great Britain, did well, but it's just, just kind of a weird thing. Uh, there was probably some politics involved in, in not releasing that here during that time. Now, if you don't like uh, Bob Dylan, the song was covered by uh, folks like Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, it's been sung by Tracy Chapman, Simon and Garfunkel, the Beach Boys, Joan Baez, Phil Collins, Billy Joel, Bruce Springsteen. You think, oh, that's going all down one way. And also covered by Burl Ives. Wouldn't that be an interesting sound? Uh, and now, of course, our own Bob Green. Um, the song was ranked number 59 on Rolling Stone's 2004 list of the 500 greatest songs of all time. Again, for a song that was not released as a single in the United States. So why the staying power of this song? Why, why, why do people care about this particular song? The song was about change. Now, how many of you like change? Yeah. Most of us get nervous with the question, even. I mean, there's some things that we would like to change, but how many of us have things in our lives that we don't change? We know we should because the old is just... Well, it's, it's uncomfortably comfortable, right? Now, it, uh, full disclosure, I'm actually, I'm a big fan of music. You guys know that by now if you've been around me at all. I love music. Um, I'm not actually a, a big Bob Dylan fan just because I, I haven't listened to much of the music. I, I love lyrics and how they fit together. Um, but the lyrics of this song, if you read any interviews about it, um, they were designed by Dylan to capture the angst of the protest generation. That, that's, that's one of the things he said, and it was to give, it, give them words, give them words to use with what they were doing. Now, why in the world would I have us listen to that on a Sunday morning? Because I think it still captures where we are as a society and where we are as a culture. A few years after this song was written, a fellow named Bobby Kennedy was running for president, and he would famously spend hours in poor neighborhoods in New York. And during the campaign, he was asked, why do you spend time not just shaking hands, but you, like, you get your hands dirty in these neighborhoods, and you help out, and they can't really give back to you. And of course, the idea is, well, he's doing that for the campaign. But his answer was, because my world isn't the real world. This one is. As we approach Easter... We need to recognize that the world we knew as younger people has changed. No matter how old you are, the world is changing very, very rapidly. It has changed, it is changing, and to reach the lost with the gospel, we need to know the real world that they live in. Now Dylan's song has staying power because it describes a cycle that we find ourselves in right now, and, and I figure every generation has seen some iteration of this cycle. But it seems like, uh, maybe because our, our time is right in front of us, that there's this huge divide. Do you ever feel that? Like you see things on TV or you see things out in culture and you think, man, there's this huge divide and we cannot get across it. So there's us and there's them. I want to encourage you this morning for all of us to relearn how to talk to people, to actually have a conversation, and to be present with them. The reason I'm saying all this is I, I heard this from back home. I had a conversation, and, and I hear this. It happens a lot. Why in the world would you move out there to California where all them crazy liberals are? <laughs> if you want to know what the Midwest thinks, there you go. And my answer is first, because that's where God called us. That's where we're supposed to be. And second, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. Now, you folks that have been here in California maybe your whole lives, you know you can actually escape California without leaving. A lot of folks have. What do I mean by that? Well, 
All you got to do is insulate yourself from people that don't look like, act like, believe like, or otherwise comport with your view of normal. And you have escaped California without ever leaving. And the times they are a changing. People need Jesus. They need the freedom that repentance and mercy uh, bring, that, that salvation in Christ brings. And they need it from the church, from the people, not the building. They need it from us, and they need it now. We all need it now. So, believe it or not, that's not actually the sermon intro today. <laughs> I, I was just really struck by that conversation I had, and, and I just want to pray for a minute here for all the people around us who don't know Jesus, who, who have all this hope and all kinds of things that can't deliver. And I want to pray that we will be willing to share the one who can deliver. I'm reading a book right now. I got it last week. It's called Not Beyond Reach. And, and it's written by a guy who looks really, really, you can't see that from here, but he looks really, really young. But he's a CEO and mission director of this group called Steiger International. And what I really love about it is you get his perspective from where he's at, uh, spending time with young people, and <gasps> he goes to clubs uh, at like 2 o'clock in the morning, and he talks to people about spiritual things, and as that spiritual conversation moves, he talks to them about Jesus. And what I really like about it is you have that perspective, and then at the end of each chapter, you have a note from a guy named Chip Ingram. Anybody in here heard of Chip Ingram? No? Oh, he's actually a, a pretty famous preacher guy, uh, and he's, he's older than me by probably 15, 20 years. And at the end of each chapter, he writes a note to parents, grandparents, and preachers. And a lot of those notes start with, I bet this really offends you, what was just said in this chapter, but this is where people are. And here's how we get to where they are. How many of us have believed that the church is getting them to where we are? They need to come to church. That's not how the church started. You realize that? We're going to talk about that today. So uh, let, me, let me pray and then we'll jump in here. Lord, may we all have the attitude of Isaiah, the prophet, who said, Here am I, send me. Whether it's across the living room, across the street, across the office, across the city, across the world. I pray that you build in us, that you foster in us, that you fan into flame a desire to share you with other people, a, a heart for lost people who, if we believe what the Bible says, are lost and not just lost for here, but lost forever apart from you, in a place that you prepared for the devil and his angels. So, Lord, I, I pray that you give us a heart for the lost and that you let us realize that we hold that wherever we go, that we can, we can share that with other people and bring them into fellowship with you first and with the church as a result. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, big hard right turn. How many of you in here have ever heard the ghost story, The Man with the Golden Arm? You ever heard of that? No? Really? No, as a kid, that was a standard among campfire ghost stories. And I wondered if it was just a Midwestern thing. And then I found that none other than the very famous Vincent Price had included it on a recording uh, on one of his scary ghost story albums. Okay, so if you haven't heard the story of the man with the golden arm, you should go look it up. Although that's kind of a random thing. Here's something else I found, though, while researching that idea. There is a man known to have a golden arm, for real, and he's not scary. Uh, it's not Sandy Koufax for, for baseball historians. This guy, no, the, the one I'm going to talk about, has saved over 2 million lives with his golden arm. When he was 14 years old, he had to have this major chest surgery, and it required a lot of donated blood to keep him alive. And uh, it was as he was recovering as a 14-year-old that he pledged himself, as soon as I turn 18, I'm going to start donating blood to save other people. And as soon as he turned 18, he starts donating blood. 
And after the first couple of donations, his blood was found to contain this extremely unusually high level of DRH group antigen. How many of you know exactly what that is? A couple of you, maybe. Um, so uh, he began donating plasma because you could do that more often, and the doctors would make an antibody cocktail to give to pregnant women who were RH negative. See, if a mom is RH negative, so, so that little plus or minus after your blood type is, uh, from what I've gathered, I might be wrong, but I think it's this, it's your RH designator. And if she doesn't get this shot, then when her blood mixes with the baby's blood during delivery, the baby's system can be overwhelmed, the liver and other organs will shut down, the heart will give out, I mean, it's all kinds of bad stuff. So this guy, he becomes part of a group of people, and, and some are, are known for their research prowess, and some for their, their plasma properties, and others as just advocates to, to make this thing happen, all working to make this kind of death and, and uh, uh, disfigurement and, and all kinds of mental uh, um, disability kind of things. They, they wanted to make this death and, and situation preventable. So this man with the golden arm donated faithfully and in 2011 donated his 1,000th donation. See, I'm crazy impressed with this guy just because of my own fear of needles. And this guy is like, yeah, I'm going to go give this through a needle. So in 2018, he was finally shut down due to age at 1,173 donations. And it's a world record that still stands. And he lives in Australia and still advocates for this cause at the age of 87 years old. Anybody know his name? You don't know his name. I mean, a guy who has saved over 2 million lives... His name should be a household name, right? But it's not. Neither is John Gorman or Vincent Frieda, prisoners in New York's famous Sing Sing prison who volunteered as human guinea pigs for all this. Olive Simler, Mary Taliu, and Marianne Cummins. Oh, and, and the guy with the golden arm, James Harrison. These people, along with the people who continue to donate plasma, they're still saving lives. Now, here's the thing. I, I came to this knowledge when I was researching our passage for the week and in trying to come up with this relatable way to introduce it. And so I Googled greatest historical achievements by unknown people. That's what I put in my Google search. And, and, and it was interesting until, as I continued reading about this particular thing, this RH negative thing, that three, I figured out that three of the babies that were saved were mine. It went from interesting to me to this very personal moment of clarity in God's provision and praise and thankfulness. You see, I had never known the names of any of those people, but uh, what, and it's kind of, it's, it's dumb and funny and probably tragic at the same time. When they told us that Guyane would have to get the Rogam shot, I even joked to the nurses when we went to the hospital, my wife's here to get her Rogam shot, ha, ha, ha. So as I researched this week, there was also a fair bit of repentance for taking such a thing for granted. These folks that were either blessed to have these antigen properties in their blood or the smarts to come up with the research or the courage to allow themselves to be tested on, their names were never really important to me. And I don't say that in a mean way. It's just that the power in the blood was what was important. Their names couldn't have saved my kids, but the power in the blood, now that meant everything. As we get into the Bible this morning, I want you to kind of hang on to that story, and, and it'll start making sense how that applies to me and you. We're, we're in Acts chapter 11, and Luke, the author of the book of Acts, has just wrapped up talking about this encounter with Peter um, and his return to Jerusalem after spending time in a place called Lydda and another place called Joppa and another place called Caesarea and how God had opened the door to the Gentiles. And Luke has reported on the, uh, how the Jews in Jerusalem, how their initial reaction was, Peter, how in the world could you go to those kind of people and, and even eat with them? And Peter's answer had satisfied him. He, he told him how Cornelius and these other outsiders had received the gift of repentance and the Holy Spirit as they received Christ and they were baptized. So Luke then gives a quick historical overview. 
a kind of, oh, okay, so, so I've been writing, you know, I'm 11 chapters in, you know, they didn't have chapters, but he's, I, I'm, I'm about halfway through what I'm writing, and, and so I need to say where we're at at this point in the story. So the next couple of verses that we're going to read cover somewhere between 7 and 10 years, depending on which scholarly timeline you're looking at, and we're going to pick it up in Acts 11, verse 19, it's page 1711 in the Bibles there in the pew, if you want to follow along there. This is God's Word, so we're going to open it together. Verse 19, chapter 11, So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. So, so this would have actually been about 7 to 10 years earlier when the door hadn't opened to the Gentiles just yet, and this guy named Stephen is killed, and this guy named Saul is on a rampage, and the disciples, all except the apostles, they're scattered out of Jerusalem. And then verse 20, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well, preaching the good news of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so we, we actually started in the book of Acts last year, and way back when we first started, I made this statement, Without an Acts 8.1, there would have been no Acts 1.8. So Acts 1.8 says, it's Jesus talking, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. And Acts 8.1 says, now Saul approved of putting Stephen to death, and on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. So our author, Luke, is bringing this whole thing full circle. In Acts 1.8, Jesus told the apostles and disciples gathered there as he's about to be taken up to heaven, so 40 days after his death and resurrection, that they're going to take this thing worldwide. I can't even imagine what they must have thought. They, I, who, us? Well, I mean, sometimes Jesus kind of exaggerated. He spoke in hyperbole, so maybe this is one of those times. Maybe it's like when he was telling a parable and he would say something. Maybe, maybe it's like that. But then later, this persecution happens, and then they really do scatter. They go into all these different places that Jesus had mentioned. And Luke reports it here in Acts 11, and he's covering it more from a geographical standpoint. He's telling where they were than, than a chronological standpoint, because the ge geography represented here, it's about 300 miles. And that's a really long distance when walking or horseback or cart or, or even water uh, are your main transport options there in the first century. So this was a, a fanning out of the gospel message of Jesus that was years in the making from the time of Stephen's death. And then verse 21 of chapter 11, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. That's really kind of a central verse for us today. I want to ask you a question. You, you, you see that word in the verse... I think it was ninth word in. What's that word? Them. Who is that? Who is them? Can you name some of them? These are the them that left Jerusalem. Can you name them? Well, maybe fact is we're not told what do we know about them well they experienced persecution we know that they ran from the familiar places they knew into unfamiliar places they didn't know and there was a purpose to their running away you see they they could have just stayed where they were at see the the the, the, the idea was hey as long as you renounce jesus we don't care you can stay here so they could have just renounced christ Simple solution, just keep it real private. Nobody needs to know what you really believe out there in the real world. We'll just keep it real private, and, and I, can, I can worship Jesus right here in the privacy of my own whatever. I mean, God, wouldn't, wouldn't God understand? I mean, Jesus didn't really mean that whole Great Commission thing for all of his followers, right? I mean, that was just for the super disciples, the super Christian folks. But, but they, they, they didn't do that, did they? They went out from Jerusalem, clinging to their faith, and they spread it where they went. 
And it's interesting to me that, that many of them went to their fellow Jews. I mean, uh, for, for a time, they thought this is what it's supposed to be. It's, it's supposed to be uh, the, the, the culmination of the Jewish religion. We, we have to stay with the Jews. And so a lot of them did that, which is interesting to me because the Jews weren't always real friendly to folks who believed in the cross, especially the resurrection. And then the other people, the, the, the guys that Luke mentions from Cyprus and Cyrene, that they, they go into these other places, these really unclean places, these really morally bankrupt places, and, and religiously and culturally really messed up places. And what's the result? The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of people believed and followed Jesus. Can you see that? Can you envision that? Let your mind wander to that for just a second. People come into Jesus through this really novel method of other people telling them about Jesus. Who would have thought? And it's not from a, a point of strength or power. It's not like, man, if you come and you be with us, you'll live your best life now. It's not that. They're on the run. They're fleeing persecution. And these other people, they hear the message of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus and God's love for them. And they say, yeah, we want to be a part of that. We want to join up with these people who are on the run. They're fleeing persecution and they're following this Jesus. Then they're taking the risk to share it with him, share him with us. A whole bunch of thems. Regular people spreading the message of God's kindness and mercy through Jesus. We also see from these verses that their efforts and success converge on this place called Antioch. And the news of this reaches Jerusalem, where the apostles are still mostly gathered. And some went to the Jews in Antioch, some went to the Gentiles in Antioch. So, so we got this whole thing converging with these two different thrusts of the gospel. Again, chapter 11, verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Verse 22, The news about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with all, res all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and considerable numbers were added to the Lord. So now we actually finally put a name to this thing, Barnabas. He's finally a name in this whole thing, and he's just going to see what's going on. He gets to go see what all them thems have been up to. And it resulted in this first truly multicultural church. That's what Barnabas gets to witness. So what's the big deal about this place called Antioch? Well, it's a real reach from Jerusalem geographically and culturally. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire in the first century. It was a huge business and trade route city. It connected big and diverse areas like Egypt and Asia Minor and Greece and Italy and Mesopotamia. Antioch was kind of a central hub. And, and, and as far as culture, I was reading this one commentary, and, and this commentator put it like this. One might say that Jerusalem was all about religion. Rome was all about power. Alexandria was all about intellect. And Athens was all about philosophy. Adding to that, one might say that Antioch was all about business and immorality. Before we move forward, does Antioch remind you of any place in modern times? Actually, in a, in a perverse and overachieving way, it almost seems like our own country could lay claim to all of those, doesn't it? A preoccupation with each one of those things. We might be able to say, uh, even though the quote was, one might say Jerusalem was, uh, we might be able to say, one might say that the United States is all about religion. The United States is all about power. The United States was all about intellect. The United States is all about philosophy. Adding to that, the United States is all about business and immorality. How many of you would say that would maybe be a pretty accurate description of where we are as a country? And so our own country, in, in our own context and time, all of the above, which makes it such a target-rich ministry environment. 
Our country is no less ripe in our time and culture than immoral and dollar-driven Antioch was in the first century because everyone is hungry for more, more meaning, more purpose, more love. And even though the times may be a change in, those basic God-designed hungers have never changed. Okay, so back to Barnabas. He's made it to Antioch. He's doing what Barnabas does. He encourages people, and so much so that the church is flourishing in the middle of this crazy, sinful, hedonistic, humanistic culture. The gospel culture is flourishing. So Luke writes about Barnabas, verse 25, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. So Barnabas goes about 120-ish miles, possibly by a water route, and might have made it a little bit faster, but maybe over land to go get this guy named Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, we don't know exactly the reasoning that Barnabas said, I'm going to go get Saul. Saul's got to be a part of this. We don't, we're not told why. If you remember, Saul had fled to Tarsus because some Jewish folks wanted to kill him after he converted to Jesus. I, th I think that the safest thing that we can say is that Barnabas was led by the Holy Spirit to bring Saul into the ministry at this point. And so the church continues to grow, and then there's this curious end to the sentence there, Luke concludes with, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. This wasn't always a compliment. Antioch was actually known, this is so weird to be known for something like this, but Antioch was actually known in the ancient world as a place that came up with mean nicknames. Isn't that a weird thing to be known for? Um, biblical Greek New Testament scholar, a guy named Kenneth Woost, wrote about that and how this term Christian was derisive. It was a way to further alienate this group from the lifestyles of the rich and immoral. And even when it wasn't intentionally mean, it was at least a recognition that these people were different. They crossed cultural and religious and geographic barriers to bring others into the relationship with Jesus by bringing them into this relationship with them, with the church, the missional movement spreading across the known world. They didn't wait for people to come to them. And the world took notice. This other article I read about this said, this group of people was redefining community in a radical and unprecedented way, so much so that a new word was needed to categorize what in the world was happening. And so the church grew because the people, the early disciples, scattered away from the familiar, took Jesus to new hostile territory, at least apathetic territory, and entered the marketplace of ideas with the love and mercy and kindness of God in supernatural ways, and they were empowered and led by the Holy Spirit. In fact, Antioch is going to become one of the most prominent churches of purpose and mission for the first few centuries as the church was spreading. It became the home base for Paul's or, or you know, Saul, uh, who will be called Paul later on, uh, for his missionary journeys. Antioch becomes the home base. In the second century, it was the church at Antioch that one of the elders there coined the term trios, which we know as Trinity to describe the relationship between God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. This was a group of people who continued to meet together, continued to learn and pray and press into what it meant to follow Jesus in that way. And while we know about Barnabas and Saul and later a couple of other people by name, the rest of these people who, who launched by the hand of the Lord what would become the dis distinctive Christian movement of Jew and Gentile together, distinct from being just a sect of Judaism, this movement that sponsored the missionary journeys of Saul and Barnabas and so many others, this strategic gateway to all kinds of different people from different backgrounds, different kinds of outcasts and outsiders and messy people, the folks that landed there in Antioch with only the gospel message, people who have shared the gospel through the centuries because of their efforts, so that millions of people have been saved, well, we should know their names, right? They're just them. They're just them. You see, the power wasn't in their names. The power was in the blood of the name they carried, Christ. The word Christian actually meant the religious right, the evangelical movement. No! It's what it might mean today, right? The term Christian meant 
the party of Christ or the Christ ones. And it was the blood of Christ that united them. Our series we started last week is called Easter is for Everyone. We, we talked about vision last week and how the earliest Jews couldn't see the vision of how the resurrection was good news for everyone. But after Peter and Cornelius and now this church at Antioch, the die was set. People, just regular people, saved and given freedom from the curse of sin by Jesus, empowered and led by the Holy Spirit, this thing called the church moves in the direction of bound and broken, messed up people and cultures to share the story of Jesus and testify to his goodness and love. So we have this board in the back, and I, and I do, I hope it helps us visualize that work, which is our work. We screw in a bulb when we share our faith in Jesus Christ, when we invite people into our lives to see just how good God is and how his plan of salvation, of freedom, of forgiveness of sins and redemptions is for them too. It's for everyone. And I'm encouraged as I see some bulbs already screwed in. And I heard conversations that were happening around that board of people, and they were, they were sharing their stories, spurring each other on, encouraging one another. Because it's for everyone. You see, we're just a big group of thems. That's what we are. People might remember our names when we're gone, but that's a whole lot less important than if they remember the name of Jesus. Everything else we are going to do on this planet, and this is not meant to discourage anybody, but it's just the, 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 the God-honest truth. Everything else we do on this planet is going to burn up. The, the degrees we earn, the money we've made, the inheritances or land that we leave behind, the accomplishments that we have, all of it eventually burns up. And it's not that those things aren't good things, but if they're the main thing of our lives, then we've missed the point. We've missed the power that's in the blood. So I want us, as we approach Easter, to think about all the thems that have lived out their faith and told people about Jesus so that you and me could be here today, saved and able to share that message with others. You see, I, I, I hope and I, and I think, because we're sitting here, there wasn't a time where somebody drew a line and said, you know what, Jim is just beyond God's mercy. I'm not going to share it with him. Insert your own name there. And so how could we do that to anybody else? Who would we exclude from God's mercy? I hope you don't have a list of names you just thought of. <laughs> but it's pretty easy to do. And we don't want to be those people. We want to be them people. We want to be thems that go into the world without regard to our own glory or anything else to share the message of Christ. Because even those people that helped us get here, the power isn't in their names. It's in His name and the blood by which we're saved. Amen? Amen. Band, if you guys want to come on back up. It'd be nice to be able to tell you something different than what I'm about to say now, but I want to tell you that if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you are lost. And you may not even feel like you're lost, but it's true. And no matter how good or bad you've been in your life, no matter what you've built or destroyed, none of that matters when it comes to eternity. God knew that, and he sent Jesus into this world to become the perfect sacrifice for your sin. And somebody has prayed for you. Somebody has invited you. Somebody has shared this story with you. And it's the story of rescue, of redemption, of freedom, and of eternal life. And if you don't have that, then praise God, you've been granted what's called repentance. That whole thing we talked about, change, nobody likes change. You know what? The story of the gospel is change. You get to change. You get to repent. You get to say, God, I can't do this. Jesus, I need you because I can't fix me. And Jesus says, I got this handled. I handled it. He didn't say when he died, I'm finished, did he? He said, it is finished. And so if you don't know him this morning, I, I pray that you'll ask somebody around you. You'll come up when we sing our song. 
together and we can have that conversation. And for those of us who are Christians, maybe we've taken our light that we're supposed to shine. Not even supposed to shine, but like we're designed to shine that when Jesus comes into our lives. And maybe we've put it back under the lampshade. I want to encourage you to do what Jesus said to do. Let your light shine. Knowing that there's power in the blood, power to save, to extend God's grace through the gospel of Jesus Christ, let it flow through you as a conduit, as a transfusion of mercy to other people. I want to promise you, from personal experience and and more importantly from what God's word says, is that he will give you more of himself the more of him that you pour out. You don't have a finite amount of God to pour out to other people, of of Jesus to pour out to other people, and then, oh, I'm, I'm almost out. It doesn't work that way. The more you pour out, the more he pours in. So if you, if you think, man, why isn't my, my life with Jesus more vibrant? Pour it out. Don't let it get stale. Right? Some people say that. My life with Jesus is just kind of stale. Well, pour it out. Get some new. Because when you pour it out, it don't stay stale. Amen? Amen? All right. So if you would, stand up. If you have a need this morning, you want to come talk to me, I'll be up here. Uh, if, if you want to go to the rear, we used to have a cross back there, and now we have a reminder of who all Jesus is for. So you can go to the rear and, and pray as well. Um, but, but don't leave here today with, heal, uh, with hurts uh, unhealed or questions unanswered. If we can get that process started today for you. All right, let's pray together. God, thank you for this moment in time that you have allowed us to be together. We live in in interesting times. Give us courage to take your name from this place and share it with others because it is only under your name, by your name, Jesus, that people can be saved. Give us wisdom and mercy at the same time and give us courage. Holy Spirit, move us, move our feet, our hands, and our lips to show your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.